This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. So my name is John Bishop. Welcome to the Boston WordPress Meetup. Um, this month's a little bit different. We have uh, one developer track, and then we're going to bring anybody else have any questions or if you feel like this is over their head, uh, welcome to go out in the lobby, and I'll be out there. Uh, along with anyone else who wants to volunteer their time to help some other people, uh, and we'll do an expert zone out there. So, uh, who in here already plans on going and doing the expert zone versus staying in here? Just raise your hand. All right, that, that's fine. And who in here actually, uh, when we were RSVP, said that you might be able to actually volunteer your time? So, if people do end up coming outside, <laughs> could anyone actually come out and volunteer some time? Cool. All right, so we'll make it work. Um, so Wi-Fi code, WP0924, uh, basically it's just WP and the date, you haven't figured it out by now. Um, but our website's bostonwp.org, bostonwp on Twitter, and bostonwp hashtag. Uh, feel free to tweet, uh, I try to, um, and if I see other tweets in here that are worth tweeting, I'll retweet it from the Boston WP account, so uh, help us out. Oh, it's not up? So uh, first off, big thanks to Microsoft Nerd for letting us do this since April 15, 2009. Um, really hard to find other locations to do this kind of thing, so the fact that we have this space available is huge and awesome, so uh, big thanks to them. Uh, big thanks to HostGator. Um, currently, they host the Boston VP site. Uh, it's just really affordable hosting, pretty reliable. Um, they have a one-click install for WordPress, so if you're pretty new to it, uh, it's an easy way to get started. And to use the Boston WP Meetup code when you actually uh, register, get 25% off. And we'd also like to thank WP Engine. Um, last month, we gave away some free accounts. Uh, we have more free accounts, just not for this month. So come back next month, we might do double the accounts, but um, basically, really great managed WordPress hosting. Um, if you haven't checked it out, go check it out. If you're at WordCamp, you probably got a free account. Um, it's really good, so worth checking out. Uh, our pizza sponsor for this month is, um, we don't have one. <laughs> so, basically, uh, we have limited funds from everything that we do, uh, but unless someone steps up and actually sponsors pizza, we don't have pizza for the event. Uh, Kurt and I can't run the $300. Uh, to actually get pizza. So um, please step up and sponsor. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk a little bit about your company. Um, if you're a tech company or something looking for developers or bloggers, publishing experts, whatever, um, it's a great way to get the word out. Your logo and information goes up on the Meetup site for the entire month. Um, and then we make an announcement in here. So uh, if you know anybody, if you're interested, contact me or Kurt, um, and we'll have pizza next month. So, Boston WordPress Meetup is still currently the second largest WordPress Meetup in the world. Um, the one largest, larger, is uh, New York. So, all we need is like another 1,000 people, and we're good. So, tell your friends, and we'll be the first largest. Uh, we're growing every day. Currently, it's only uh, me and Kurt, uh, Tom and Rico help out a lot. Um, but we can use help with everything from tweeting about the event uh, during it. Uh, helping us manage like, social media stuff uh, in between, helping us find sponsors and speakers, um, anything. So helping out with the event doesn't necessarily mean that you're up here talking and running the event. Anything you can help out with, we're greatly appreciative. So uh, if you're interested, please come up and talk to me or email myself or Kurt, um, and we'll get back to you and make something work. Uh, uh, we could really use the help. So especially you know, like today, where Kirk couldn't make it, and I'm the only one. It'd be nice to have somebody else uh, uh, running the show with us. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we have our own website, bostonwp.org. Uh, it's where you can go to get the, the meeting minutes, uh, meetup minutes, uh, info, videos. We have a job board up there. Uh, it's relatively active. Um, we're going to be doing more with it in the future to hopefully get more activity on there and make uh, more people aware of the fact that we have a job board. Um, 
we had forums, it got spammed, so it's kind of sitting in the background right now. We do plan on having that up soon. I know I say that every time. But uh, we do plan on having it up soon with a new website, so look out for that. Um, and so we created a, a Boston WP GitHub account. We had uh, some ideas for some community projects. So we're hoping to do more on the WordPress dev side with Meetup. Maybe something like hackathons, maybe checking out the WP Candy podcast somewhere. Merging um, <laughs> <laughs> Brian's pull request. But uh, check out, uh, look, look up Boston WP on GitHub if you guys want to get involved or have an idea for a community project, uh, come up to me, we're open to anything. I just want to do more to kind of help the developers learn from each other. Uh, we do a lot of kind of giving back to the community and I want us to be able to kind of grow together as well. So uh, check that out. Uh, so once again, WordCamp Boston 2012, if you went, the videos are up on WordPress.tv. Um, they're all tagged with WordCamp Boston 2012, so you can find a lot of the videos there. Uh, also, if you saw someone that you thought was just amazing and blew you out of the water, uh, check out speakerrate.com and go and give that person a rating. Um, just over time, it helps them out. Uh, it takes a lot to put themselves out there, so the feedback's really great. So if you have to get a second, uh, check that out. Uh, also, we have WordCamp Providence 2012 coming up, uh, October 27th, uh, 2012. Uh, tickets are on sale now. They haven't announced the speakers yet very soon. Um, but check it out, 2012.providence.wordcamp.org. Uh, it'll be equally, if not better, than uh, Word, Word Camp Boston. So definitely worth checking out as well. So today we have our boy Brian, doing MVC in WordPress. Uh, he doesn't use Twitter, so tweet at him. So he does. <laughs> um, and like I said, if anyone does have questions about anything WordPress, uh, don't be afraid to step out and find me out there. Even if it's just a small question you want to creep out and come back in, perfectly fine. Um, and if we do have an excess of people out there, if other developers wouldn't mind stepping out and helping me out, that'd be great. Right? Any questions? Great. Let me get started. Hey. All right, cool. So, thank you all for your patience. Thanks for being here. Um, My name is Brian, and I'm here to talk about uh, MVC development in WordPress, and more specifically, SWP MVC, which is the framework that we put together at Streetwise Media to make MVC development easier for us. Um, brief introduction, full name Brian Zellickson, you already saw my Twitter handle. Uh, I don't tweet like John said, but I do answer, so if anybody wants to get in touch, that's a good way to do it. Uh, I am the VP of Engineering at Streetwise Media. We are a four-person development team right now, working on two high-traffic sites uh, built on one installation of WordPress multi-site. The sites that we run are bostono.com and inthecapital.com. Uh, Bostono is a Boston-focused news and technology site, and the capital is a DC-based uh, equivalent. Boston O is our flagship site. We did about 2 million visits last month. In the capital is newer as of like March this year, but quickly catching up in terms of traffic. Um, I just found out actually, I, I've been timing myself and I've got like about an hour's worth of content exactly. Uh, so I had planned to say like questions to the end if there's time. Uh, I think we lost some time getting set up, but I also think we've got some extra cushions. So if anybody wants to interrupt at any time, shoot a hand up and I'll be happy to. Uh, it, uh, to answer any questions. Um, before I dive in, just out of curiosity, uh, by show of hands, who are developers in the room? All right, a lot of us. Um, and uh, again, by show of hands, who's familiar with MVC? Okay, a lot. And anybody use it? Cool. Anybody ever use it in WordPress? All right, cool. So that's, it that's great. Out. This is uh, <laughs> this is good. This is good. This is uh, the right crowd, and I'm glad to see that. Um, so diving in, uh, just a little bit about the origin of our framework. Um, I am very enthusiastic about web development. Uh, when I'm all caught up with my responsibilities at Streetwise, I typically find myself playing with different languages, uh, different frameworks, trying different approaches to web development to see what I can gain and bring it back to my work with WordPress. Um, about four months ago, we built a careers platform and launched it on Bostino. 
which from the consumer side uh, looks kind of like a job board. All right, we've just got a bunch of different filters so people can narrow their search down. Uh, when you find a listing you're interested in, you can click on it and see a whole bunch of information about the career position, the company that's hiring, so on and so forth. Uh, from the publisher side of this, there's a, a whole interface uh, that we use for uh, people who want to purchase a job posting uh, to obviously fill out all of this information that you see, uh, manage their job posting. So when you publish a post to our site, uh, you can see how many people have viewed your career opening. You can see how many times someone clicked this apply button at the bottom. And then uh, you can actually collect applications through the site. So people will upload. When I, when I post a career opening, I decide what files I want you to upload. And then uh, applicants can upload to the site and publishers can download their applications through the site. Uh, so it's actually quite a bit of functionality that we put together. And in the process of putting it together, we more or less rolled our own MVC framework. Uh, but, as is often the case with the first time doing something like this, we baked it into the product. So, we had all the elements of a reusable framework that were hard-coded into this careers product. Uh, it took about two weeks after launch before we sat down to discuss our future product roadmap, and it took me about five minutes in that meeting to realize we were going to need to make that code reusable. Um, so, I sat down. Uh, I went down a list of frameworks that I've used, uh, Rails, Django, Express, Fuel PHP, Coding Matter. I thought about what are the things that I find most attractive in working with those frameworks. Um, I looked around to see what open source components were out there that I could use in putting together a solid framework uh, where you know a lot of the stuff that we that we baked into this product initially we reinvented some wheels and I of course wanted to avoid that in making something truly reusable. So what options that I have in terms of uh, leveraging other people's work, uh, preferably something with a community behind it. Uh, and then I looked back at the code for this careers product and, you know, picked apart what I could extract from it to reuse my own work and putting the framework together. Uh, and what we came up with has been pretty useful to us so far. Um, before I go any further, quick introduction for, I guess, the quarter or so of the room that, that uh, is new to MVC, I mean, review for those who already know about it. MVC is an approach to software architecture. It stands for Model View Controller, and the basic premise is that your code is split into three distinct areas of responsibility. So you have your model code, which is solely responsible for data. It's responsible for retrieving data, it's responsible for storing data, it's responsible for manipulating and validating, and that's it. Um, you have your view code, which is just presentation. It's what's shown to the person interacting with your uh, software. And for us as web developers, that basically means HTML, CSS, and some JavaScript. Um, and then you have your controller code, which is often referred to as glue code. Uh, basically what it's doing is responding to user requests. So if I click on a link, or if I click on a button, the controller is going to field that request decipher what the user is asking for, and then coordinate the different parts of the code base that are required to satisfy the request that's been made. Um, depending on the diagram and the textbook you're looking at, some people will lay it out differently. Oftentimes you see uh, the controller placed squarely in between the model and the view. Um, so what you'll see is that the model and view can't actually talk to each other without going through the controller. Apparently, some people feel very strongly about this. I've been flamed on Reddit because our uh, framework is actually, this diagram here is much more representative of what we do, where uh, the model is actually aware of the view and able to update it. And apparently, like I said, some people feel strongly about it, uh, but regardless of what's in the textbook, what we found is that taking this approach saves us many lines of code and a lot of hours of development time. So this is what we've gone with. Um, moving ahead, why would you want to use MVC in WordPress? Um, so I've got a list of four major reasons that we've managed to reap benefits from. Uh, the first one is pretty much what I just discussed, separation of concerns, right? By breaking some code out into models, some into views, some into controllers, uh, you get some benefit. In typical WordPress style code, you're going to see business logic, data retrieval and manipulation, and presentation code all in the same place. Sometimes it's just a file that runs from top to bottom. Sometimes it's a function, and function contains all these elements. Um, 
what we get out of splitting them apart, uh, we get more organized code that's easier to read and easier to come back to. We get the ability for several people to work on one initiative at a time. So if all of your code for a particular page is in one file or in one function, even if you're using the best version control system out there, if you put two developers on that one file and they're working at, on it at the same time, when it comes time to merge those teams back in, you're almost guaranteed to have conflicts. So by splitting things apart, you can split the work apart. Um, and then lastly, it allows for collaboration between people with specialized skill sets. So uh, because the code is focused on different areas of responsibility, someone who has a different skill set can be equally as effective by zeroing in on one section of the code base. Uh, to see how this looks with some examples, I've grabbed an excerpt here from uh, the 2011 theme, the content single.php file, and what we see here is a mixture of all these different elements of the code, right? We have HTML tags, which are a presentation layer. This is view code. Uh, we have some business logic here. The first thing my eyes go to is uh, if, else, Right, if I'm conditionally checking for the state of some data and determining what to do based on that, that's usually falls into the category of business logic. Uh, and then last, we've got data retrieval right here, where categories list equals get the category list. This function is actually running the query and saving the results in this variable. Same here with tag list. So this is everything happening in one place. One person job, because if you have multiple people working on it, can conflict. And what's more is the one person working on this file needs to be familiar with HTML. They need to be familiar with the style sheet for the particular site they're working on and know that the markup they're building is going to look good. They need to be familiar with PHP. They need to know the WordPress API. So the alternative, when we split our concerns apart, we've got now two files. First, we've got this single post.tpl file at the top. And if you look at the contents, aside from these funny looking comments, which actually are valid HTML. The, the, the caveat is that you start placing them funny places like in an href or in a class, and that actually is invalid markup. But the comments themselves technically are valid HTML, so we can pat ourselves on the back and say we're writing pure HTML templates. Um, but again, you know, it's still plain HTML. There's not much to it. And the comments have a pretty simple logic to them. Obviously, I've got an opening and closing post class region, and this becomes uh, an interactive region that I can access from a view object in my PHP code. Uh, same thing here, post permalink, open and close. And this is something that I think, even if you've only ever worked with HTML, probably takes five or six minutes to wrap your head around. Right? It's not like embedding PHP, running conditionals, all the functions, etc. So is that, uh, are those comments uh, like your version of templating? Your, your exactly. Of these, this particular syntax, sorry. Um, in this particular syntax of these comment tags, they're specific to the templating engine that we use with our framework. So it denotes a, a section that can either be copied or replaced from the controller code or from my code. Was that, um, you wrote that as well, the template? No, we, we took the template engine. So like I said, we tried to reuse whatever we could. Uh, the template engine was, was one of the components that we were able to find a, a great one file, one class, lightweight templating engine uh, and put that to work for us. So then on the other side of this, we have a uh, controller file here, which is just PHP. There's no markup in it at all. Uh, assuming I left out, you know, we, we're going to run a query here to populate a post variable, which is in reference down here. Uh, all I'm doing in this controller is I'm creating a view object using this controller method, uh, this template, single post, which refers to the file name of this template file. All right. So this is going to create a view object and save it in the output variable. I'm going to define this class variable conditionally. I'm just basically saying if this post is in category three, then I want uh, post cat three to move the class string. Otherwise, I want post. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the view object to the render method on a post model that I've retrieved. And what will happen is the post object will find any tags in here, like uh, post title, for example. So post title matches the name of an attribute on the post model. So the post render method finds that tag and says, oh, I know what to put there. And it'll populate anything that matches up. And then we do some manual replaces afterwards, because obviously post class is not a property of the model. So we'll manually drop in the class variable that we set up, and then last we'll replace the permalink with get permalink. So uh, again, the main advantages here, we've got 
in my mind, something that's much easier to read and digest if I have to revisit this code. We also have it split between two files. So whereas on this last slide, this is a one-person job, uh, this is a two-person job. And because it's the same amount of work split between two people, you could more or less say it's probably going to take about half the time. Uh, and then lastly, obviously, uh, with the, the template file, uh, I don't really need to know more than HTML. So if you have someone on your team that's not really that good with PHP and doesn't know the WordPress API, this is fine for them to contribute, and they can pull their weight just writing straight HTML. Same for uh, someone who's not really good with HTML. I mean, I, I know it, but personally, I'm better with PHP and JavaScript, and if you give me markup to write, it's probably going to look pretty ugly, so I try to keep my hands off of it. Um, so, again, you, you see those benefits coming from splitting out the concerns. Uh, the next major win that we've had from using MVC, and this is, uh, I, I don't know if I would call this really inherent to MVC, but it is something that I consistently see with MVC frameworks. It's something that we have implemented with ours. Uh, it's what's known as eager loading. Uh, eager loading related data uh, is a practice that cuts down on overhead generated by multiple queries to the database, which is very common in WordPress style code. Uh, the source of the problem that eager loading solves is known as the n plus one query problem, which is actually a kind of well-known issue with any database-driven software. Uh, and very, like I said, very frequent in WordPress. You find this in WordPress source code. You find it on the codex all over the place. You find it in popular themes and plugins. Um, and this is a problem that eager loading solves. And to, to show you a little bit uh, about how this problem works and what this problem actually is, I've got an example set up here. Uh, I have these two pages, recent thumbs slash WP style, and then I have recent thumbs slash SWP MVC style. So obviously, these pages are doing the same exact thing, only the style actually refers to the code style used to render it. And uh, if I pull up the code that's being used to render this, uh, it's in a controller that there's, a, there's an example plugin in the framework folder that I just threw in there with some, it's like a scratch pad with some miscellaneous stuff. So if you've gone through documentation, you've gone through the tutorial, you want some more examples of how you can use it, there's this example plugin that shows you just some random things you can do with it. One of them was this side-by-side -side comparison of... Oh, yeah, that's bad. Uh, let me see if I can do that real quick. So where we work... Uh, we have these two methods in the controller, WP style, SWP MVC style, respectively responsible for the output on this WP style page and this SWP MVC style page. They're both doing the exact same thing. Uh, they're just doing it a little bit differently. One is using a framework. One is using regular old WordPress style code. And the first thing I want to look at is basically defining the N plus one query problem. Uh, and we can do that looking at the WordPress style code because we're producing it in the WordPress style code. And something that I want to point out, uh, as I was saying, this is rampant in WordPress uh, style code out there on the web. This code here, which is actually <laughs> responsible for creating the N plus one query problem, I took directly from the codex. So if you go to the WordPress codex and you look up the function called get the post thumbnail, they'll give you this exact snippet as an example. And the only thing I've changed actually is the number of posts that I've created. So if we step through what this code actually does, the first thing that happens is we run a query for 50 posts and we save it in this thumbnail uh, variable, God bless you. Then we loop through the resulting posts, we check if it has a thumbnail, and if it does, we echo out the permalink and we echo out the thumbnail itself. Um, now this is something that personally I find kind of devious about the WordPress API. Uh, these functions that we're calling, WordPress API functions in general, are very convenient, they're very easy to use, they're well indexed by Google, so it's easy to find what you need if you don't know what function you're looking for. It's also easy to forget that more than half of these functions generate SQL queries. So I'm happily looping through here, checking for a thumbnail, getting a permalink, and retrieving the thumbnail. But all the while, each one of these function calls is going to generate a query. So this is the definition of the n plus 1 query problem. The n plus 1 is actually, we're, we're actually looking at the n times 3 plus 1. n plus 1 would be one query. Right? So if we only ran one query in this loop, the plus 1 is actually this first query that we run. Okay? And if n is equal to the number of results we get from that first query, 
then by looping through those results and running a query on each of them, we're generating n more queries. Right? So there's the n plus one query problem. This is something you see again all over in WordPress. Uh, what we do differently with the framework code, and I'm going to drop a whole lot of stuff on you right now. Um, we're basically doing the same thing. I mean, this right here, we're querying for some posts. I'm asking for 50 posts, uh, saying I want them in reverse order by date. Um, there's some little magic in there that I'll talk about in a second. I'm attaching permalinks to the posts when I'm done. This is something I included in the framework just to avoid reintroducing an plus one query problem. Um, then I'm using some alternative syntax. This is underscore PHP. If anybody's used underscore job, uh, JS before, it's PHP for that, which I find to be very useful. Um, so I'm looping through the posts, and for each one, I'm loading up a view object and populating it. The, the view file itself is here. It's just a little bit of markup with some of these replaceable regions that we've already seen. Uh, so I'm looping through and rendering it out. And this is more or less the same thing that's happening in WordPress style code. The first difference you'll notice is that I don't have markup in this controller code. Uh, that's pushed out to the view. Uh, now the second thing, and this is where the, the magic is to, that, that avoids this n plus one query problem for us. Uh, what I'm using for the, the data retrieval here, the post model uh, is one of several WordPress standard models that I've included in the framework. So we've got models for posts, categories, tags, some of the common data structures that you work with in WordPress. Uh, I've included one for posts. The method that you see being called, this all method, is actually provided by the PHP Active Record Library. This is how we've implemented uh, the foundation for the model portion of the framework. PHP Active Record is fairly popular, it's very stable, it's well documented, uh, open source implementation of the Active Record pattern. Uh, for interacting with relational databases using PHP. So this syntax comes from the library. Uh, the documentation is extensive, but basically we'll walk you through what's happening. Uh, I'm asking for all posts. Then this array is my configuration to limit it. I'm saying first conditions, which is basically saying what should go in the where clause of the query. Right? Conditions goes in as an array. The first element is the string. So I'm going to say post status equals question mark. The next element and elements in sequence. I could have as many question marks as I want. The elements that follow will replace the question marks from left to right. So in this case, I only have one question mark. Publish is going to fill that out. So basically, I'm saying I want all posts where post status equals publish. The reason for using these question marks, uh, I do it out of habit all the time, but basically, whenever you're passing any kind of user input into a query, this is going to generate a prepared statement. So that will protect you from a SQL injection attack. Um, the next thing I'm asking for is to limit the query to 50 results. And now here's where the eager loading happens. I'm saying include two types of related data. I want to include related thumb meta, and I want to include a related thumbnail. These relationships are defined in the models. So when I built the post model, I defined a relationship called thumb meta. That relationship points to a separate model. In that secondary model, that model has a relationship to thumbnail which points to, again, another model. And by doing this, what I'm telling PHP Active Record is, when you go get me these posts, I want you to then go get me all of the related thumb meta. So if you're familiar with like foreign key relationships, the models know what the foreign key relationships are between these related data types. It says, oh, I know that thumb meta relates to post by post ID. So let me take all the post IDs that I got and query for all the thumb meta where the corresponding post ID is in the row. Then I know what key corresponds between thumb meta and thumb meta now. I'm going to repeat that process. So what you end up doing is instead of n plus 1 queries, we're running 3 because we've got three different types of data. And the bottom line is when you eager load your data this way, you only run as many queries as you have types of data to load. It doesn't matter how many results you're dealing with. Um, just to show it in action, if I go back to uh, the actual routes here, and uh, something else that I actually enrolled into this framework, when I worked with Field PHP, uh, I saw this uh, PHP Quick Profiler that they automatically load when you're in a development environment. I fell in love with it. I said, I have to have it if I'm going to build a framework. Uh, so I threw it in there. You turn it on with uh, a constant to find a WP config. So you know, you configure it locally and it never makes its way to the live environment. Um, so what I want to look at about this is the number of queries being run. Right? So 
we've got 24 queries here in the WordPress style code. If I switch over to the framework style code, we're running 18 queries. Okay. So we're already ahead of the game with the framework, but we still haven't seen this, this actual problem and, and the effect that it has. So what I want to do is add a new post with a thumbnail. Uh, so I create a new post, and I answer the thumbnail. By answering a thumbnail, we know that both of these pages are going to pick the post up. Um, like this picture of a cat. People like cat pictures, right? <laughs> you know this because you run uh, media site. People do like cat pictures. Uh, so now if I go back and reload, all right, First, looking at the WordPress style code, remember we're running 24 queries right now. When I refresh this page, what's going to happen is we take a look at the number of queries. We're up to 26. Okay? And uh, what I've noticed is that get permalink is finicky about whether it runs a query or not. I think WordPress might have some internal caching mechanisms to take place. Uh, but Sometimes when I do this, it goes up to 27, sometimes it goes up to 26. It always has at least two queries, and those two queries are uh, right here, has post thumbnail, and get the post thumbnail. Okay. So every time there's another post picked up by this code, that's at least two more queries added. Now, if I look at the framework style code, I mean, you, already, you probably know what's going to happen because I've been setting it up all this time, but this is my bragging. Right? Uh, Scroll back down, the new, the new post was picked up, but we're still at 18 queries. Um, looking at this particular example, we've gone from 24 to 26 queries, and we're going from comparing one to the other, it's 18 to 26, like who cares? You know, this is not going to make or break your site even under heavy load. Uh, but, quick antidote on this, uh, within my first month or so at Streetwise, we had a week where the server was crashing uh, three or four times a day. And this was my first time working as a web developer on a high-profile, high-traffic site. And I wanted to go home on Wednesday and crawl into my bed and put the web developer. It was one of the most emotionally trying times in my professional career. Uh, by about Friday, we had pinpointed it to a Twitter plugin. And what the Twitter plugin was doing was that this was in an effort to uh, optimize, no less. They, they were caching. This was a caching mechanism. Uh, the Twitter plugin was querying for the users in the database, and then checking for user meta on each user to see if there was a Twitter handle associated so that I could store it in a big array in case it needed to render it somewhere in the short code that it was responsible for. The plugin author did not anticipate that someone with 3,000 users in their database would be using this plugin. Right? Because what that means, this was generating an n plus one query problem, is that on every single page of our site, this plugin was adding over 3,000 SQL queries to the process. Of course, a little bit of traffic with that sort of thing happening, and my seat was gone, and a few minutes later, the service went. So, point being, a little example like this doesn't show you much, but this is actually a pretty serious concern. Uh, as soon as you start dealing with large data sets, even uh, just a busy home page with multiple loops and, and a, a bunch of widgets, you're going to start adding up if you're running through a loop and generating queries and errors. So, the big win for us with this is that by eager loading as a default practice, we just don't have to worry about it here. Um, next up, clean, terse, reusable code. If I go back to the examples we were just looking at, I'm not really winning any points on terseness here. These methods actually have counted are literally identical in length. Um, but as far as reusability goes, for the sake of conversation, let's say that somebody actually asked you to build this ugly page here. Uh, a client asked you, you know, build me a page, I want a list of recent posts, and I should only see the thumbnails, and they should link to the respective posts. And you do. And you ship it, and they go away happy, and they come back a week later, and they're not happy anymore. And they got a new mock-up for you, and this is what I actually meant the first time, so if you could just fix this up for me, I'd appreciate it. Um, we don't do client work, so I don't have that issue, but I used to, so I remember it. But we do have a busy and very imaginative product team, so, you know, we do get these kinds of requests often. Um, if you had implemented this using, like, a page template in a WordPress theme, you're probably just going to have to write a new page template. Right? Your queries, they're getting written again. Any function calls, especially if you've made them in the midst of the HTML markup, those functions are getting written again. 
because of the way that we've coded this, I can take the mock-up, I can hand it off to somebody who's really just focused on HTML. Remember, this was the template that we were using before for each post. So I give this to my markup guy, and I say, cut this into some HTML for me, and if he knows the template engine that we're using, maybe he'll drop these tags in for me, and that'd be real nice. If not, it takes me all of a minute to do it myself. Once that's done, notice in the controller that I'm setting the template variable to thumb here and passing that into the self-template method, which is actually creating a new object. Well, thumb corresponds to this file. So if I drop this in the same folder, what do I need to do to get that to show up? Well, I'll go to where I see thumb. I'll change it to post thumbs two which is the name of the new template, save it, and refresh. All right, and I've got a whole new product. I've got a whole new product, and I didn't even change one full one. Change half of it. All right, so this is a major, major win for us, especially if we do a lot of split testing. I mean, the, the great thing about this is you can load up an array of different views, and you can pick them at random and track their performance rates. Easy to expect. You, know, you can have an imaginative product team that wants something to look one way this week, wants something to look a different way next week, and it's really just up to the guys that do the markup. I'm, my hands are clean the first time I read this. And so, big advantage for us uh, in terms of readers. Um, the last thing that is potentially the most valuable from my perspective is that it's helping us to stay in control of our code base approach. Um, one of the things, I mean, I mean just to, to remind everyone, we've got four full-time developers. Uh, everybody's doing a minimum of 40 hours a week. Speaking for myself, and I you know I can speak for Joe and Kevin, uh, we'll all get into a project now and then, and you go home, psyched about what you're working on at the office, so you want to some work. So I say minimum 40 hours a week, because people tend to get into stuff and, and keep going. All that development effort is split between two WordPress sites on one multi-site install, and we've taken as many measures as possible to make sure that these two sites, and any site we have to network, are running on one common code base. So for all intents and purposes, we're talking about development efforts, we can call this one installation. That's a lot, over time, that's a lot of code going onto one website, right? So if we're not careful about where we put stuff and how we structure stuff, it's not going to be long before we can't do that. Nobody knows where uh, This has always been an issue for me before I even started doing this professionally. Uh, when I first started with Flutter Golf, I remember all the way back then feeling the same as I do now. When I'm ready to go write some new code, I know what I want to make, I know how I'm going to do it, and now I have to think about where to put the file and what to make. It sucks. I hate it. It's a, it's a momentum killer. It's not fun. It's not what I want to be doing. Um, but it has to be done. And especially in our kind of environment where you're adding a lot of code, adding a lot of code, if you're not careful about it, you're in trouble. So what we gain from this is instead of having asked now, where do I put this code? I only have to ask what the code does. Right? If the code is dealing with data, I know it goes in a lot. If the code is HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, is view really good. If it's fielding user requests and coordinating the various parts of the code base to satisfy that request, let's control it. Uh, and then to take that another step further, the framework, we've got a folder in there called Starter Plugin, which you copy and paste to the plugins folder when you start a new plugin. So when we start a new app using the framework, everything's got identical folder structure, everything's got identical file structure. By the time you've written five or six of these, and you need to get back to some old code. If you know what the code does, if you know what functionality you're trying to work with, you already know. Um, so I've rambled on and on about uh, the virtues of this. I figure we should talk a little bit about how you would actually go about doing it. So, so that's fine. Um, three quick, broad overview steps that will amount to little game of insight. Uh, first, we want to push all the logic concerning storage and manipulation of data into a model of some sort. Then we want to remove any logic from views. For us, that means if you have PHP and HTML in the same file, then you're probably doing something wrong. Uh, and then last, we want to use controllers to handle user requests 
using the correct models to populate the correct views and turning the correct response to the user. Diving into each in a little bit more depth, a quick comparison of how something looks uh, when you're working with a model versus working with WordPress. In WordPress, I might call get post and pass in an ID. With OVC, I would call a method on the post model. If I want a post, I should ask the post model. Right? So I would pass the ID to post file. In WordPress, I would call get permalink and pass in the post ID. With an MVC approach, you would ask a specific post what its permalink is. With WordPress, I would call WP update post and pass in an array of new settings. In an MVC approach, I'd have a post object. I could set properties to whatever values I wanted, and when I'm done changing it, I would just call the save method to write those change settings back to the views. Next, we would remove all the logic from our views. This is an easy one. It breaks code, but it's easy to do. Um, WordPress style, we've got open and closing H1, and then in the middle, some PHP that says, if this post is in category three, echo bullet in the middle of the post type. Otherwise, just echo out the post type. The alternative, again, instead of this breaks the code, this is broken code. Now we've got an MTH1 tagging, nothing else. But we've got this replaceable region here, which we'll do something with in our last step. When we use controllers to handle requests, populating the correct views with the correct models. So again, we've got the same view from that last step, which is just an H1 tag with a post title region that we can interact with. Now, excuse a typo, this is a post controller class that should extend SWP MVC based controller, not model. Uh, this is the uh, base controller controller that ships with the framework, uh, not model. And what I'm doing here, uh, the first thing I always want to do when I'm working with a controller in this framework is I want to tell the controller where the views are located. And I do that so I don't have to put a full path every time I load a view. If you start nesting views, if you have many uh, different requests being handled in the controller, you're going to end up loading views quite often. It's a pain to keep writing the same path. So what we do is we tell the controller where to find stuff so we can do shorthand. Um, the controller methods are invoked by URLs. It's actually invoked by the framework, but the framework is listening to URLs. And when a certain URL is hit, it knows oh, I have to go to this controller and call this method. Before it calls the method it's looking for, it checks to see if there's a method called before in the controller. How is the how is that routing done? I'm going to show you that one. Um, it's it's pretty straightforward. It's a lot easier than WP rewrite rules, but it's not magic. Um, so the first thing that happens is it, it'll check for a before method. Once it's run the requested method, it checks for an after method and runs that. Uh, I use the before method here to set the template directory, so I know that's always in place before the actual before method is run. And then what we're doing here, uh, accepting a slug, this, which you'll see in a moment when I go through the routing part, uh, this is passed in via URL. So when we define the route, we say there's a section of the URL that should be dynamic and passed in as an argument. The URL is going to pass us a slug as an argument. And then we're using, again, this active record syntax to find the post where post name equals question mark and post status equals published. And we're going to replace question mark with the slug that was passed in. Again, this is exactly the case why you want to use that question mark syntax, because you're accepting user input. So if uh, I didn't do that, all I have to do is put an apostrophe at the end of the URL, and you've got somebody breaking into your database. Uh, the next thing I do once I have the post, I'm going to set the title. If the post is in category three, if you remember this was the same code we had in the last slide, uh, if the post is in category three, put bullet in front. Otherwise, just give me the post title. Uh, I made a note here because if I wanted this behavior in any time that I access the post, say I always wanted a post from category three to have bullet in front, this doesn't belong in the controller. You push that logic to the model. And that way, any time you ask a, a post object, what's your title, that object knows I'm um, in category three. Here's my title. You only write that once. Um, in this case, I said, all right, we're only doing that here, so leave it in the controller. And then the last thing I'm doing, I'm loading the view file as a view object. I'm echoing the contents after doing a manual replace on the post title region that we have here in the H1 tag. Um, and at this point, we've got a working H1 tag again. It seems like a lot of work just for an H1 tag, but obviously you can more with this. Um, we've got a full MVC implementation. So getting a little more specific. Uh, 
this is that was broad MVC implementation. Specifically implementing MVC using SWP MVC, the framework that we use to write this kind of code. Um, three components that match the three aspects of MVC. We have a models component, we have a views component, we have a controllers component. The models component, like I mentioned, is at its foundation provided by the PHP Active Record Library. Uh, so anything that you do to retrieve data, to store data, to validate data, that functionality is provided by the Active Record Library. Uh, the common methods that you'll end up using uh, provided by Active Record are model, uh, <coughs> find, so whatever your model is, so it's post, post find, it's category, category find. Uh, then on an instance of a model, you'll we'll call save after you've changed some properties and you want to write that back to the database. And then uh, some functionality from the model arena that is provided by the framework uh, is model render. This is something that we added, like I said, some people hate this. They think it's wrong and they see models aren't supposed to know that it means. Uh, I don't care because it saves us a lot of code and it saves us a lot of time. So basically what happens here is if I've got a view object, which is a loaded template, uh, and I pass it to model render, the model is going to look at the template and say, for any of the properties that I have, is there a replaceable region in here? If there is, let me pop it. It just saves a ton of time. Um, next up, we've got the views component. As I mentioned, that's provided by the stamp template engine. Uh, the first thing that you deal with are these interactive regions. So this is open and closed tag for a region called region. Uh, you can have content in between the opening and closing tags, which is the point of having an open and closed. So uh, what I would do here, this could be just default in case it doesn't get replaced, or you have this view method available to you called copy. And this becomes useful when, uh, for example, we'll, we'll do a live demo in a moment, uh, if you want to loop through uh, an array of posts, which like what we're about to do, and you want to grab a subset of your template to populate with a post, Right. I don't want to grab the whole friggin' thing for every single post because that's too much. I just want the section that shows one post in a loop. I can use, if I denote that section with a starting and ending tag, then I can call copy region and I will get just that subset in between the tags. The other method that you'll use from the views component is replace. And what that does is that takes everything, including the starting and ending tag, and wipes it out, putting whatever new value passes as a second. Uh, lastly is the controllers component, which is provided entirely by the framework. Uh, basically, when you write a controller method, you're taking on the same amount of responsibility as writing a page template in a WordPress thing. So the controller is equipped with a bunch of shorthand methods that help you do the typical kind of things you might have to do in a page template. Um, the first two things that you kind of have to do uh, is set a view folder. So it's this underscore template dirt equals and then you put in a path to the views. Uh, and actually always use a trailing slash. That's another little typo there. Then once you've set the template directory, you can load view objects. Uh, basically just calling this template and the file name itself. No path, no extension. All of your view files end up with the, temp, uh, the extension .ppl which I find satisfying just because it's consistent and because I don't have to check when I go load a template. I know that the extension is going to be TPL. I don't have to write it over and over again. Uh, you can set a page title by just setting this title in the controller. Set the title of, uh, this title to whatever you want. That has to be run before you call get header, otherwise it's too late in the process. Uh, and also what needs to be called before get header is this underscore scripts. This actually exists for scripts, for styles, for uh, uh, script localizations. Uh, so all of the things that you might want to do on one particular page, if I have JavaScript that I only want on this one page, and I set this underscore scripts, and I need to set to an array of arrays. Each array in that array is a set of arguments to pass the WP in two scripts. Right? So in this case, I'm including one script where this inner array, these are just in sequence the arguments that you pass the WP in two scripts. Right, script name, script URL, array of dependencies. If I wanted to add in a script version as that last parameter, I could totally do that right there. Um, quick live demo. Everybody's still with me? I know this is starting to feel kind of long. Um, for, for, additional, know. for additional dynamic meta stuff like descriptions or keywords or anything like that, do you have similar like this? I have it in 
included that. Um, you know, at that point, you could very easily, because you're calling get header yourself, you could, and we do this sometimes, add a method to your controller call add action point to that method. And then as long as that's there before you call get header, it's going to get caught up in, in that action. Um, you know, there's, there's probably an endless amount of utility functions that I could add to the controller. At a certain point, I feel like uh, you end up with so much that there's, the, the utility starts to degrade because you have to know all of the available methods. The documentation is already, when I look at it, it's already like a little more like, you know, by the time you've got 100 utility methods in the controller. Um, but at the, by the same token, I'm planning to say it till the end, but uh, I am up here also to half beg people to open pull requests. So if anybody feels like there's something the framework should have and you want to add it in there, uh, I, I would just love to support requests. I'm uh, more than happy to merge. So uh, that said, I would love to dive into a quick demo. Now, I figured it would be kind of cool to take this static HTML CSS template and see if we could make this post loop dynamic in just a few minutes with a few lines of code. Um, and this is where I get to demonstrate the routing and everything. We'll go through a whole basic setup. The first thing I want to do when creating a plugin, uh, as I mentioned, here's my plugins folder. SWPMVC is the framework. Now, in that folder, I've got a directory called starter plugin. Right, this gets me started real fast. I just copy it, drop it in the plugins directory. I'm going to rename it. This screen share is just killing me. I'm going to rename it to demo. Just for consistency, rename the plugin file itself to demo as well. And then uh, I'm going to edit this file. And you see what you get with the starter plugin is basically all you need for a basic plugin file working. This acts as like your central spot. It's going to set up the routes. It's going to require all the controllers and modules. Uh, it's basically the, you know, the hub. Um, the first thing I want to do is change the name and description up here. Standard steps that once you've done this like three or four times, it just becomes mindless. I also need to change the class name. If you don't change the class name, and then you don't change the class name a second time, you'll have a fatal error. So it's good to always put something unique. Uh, and then there's two more references to that class name that you have to change as well. And here, this is the bootstrap. And at this point, I have a working plugin that does absolutely nothing. But it works. It won't break. So I'm going to activate it. And that way, as we make changes to it, we can see it working. This going to be a demo here. Activate. Activate. All right. So uh, the first thing we need to do if we want this plugin to actually do anything, we need a control to point to. Um, figure before we go as far as uh, dynamic post loop, we can do a simple hello world. So I'm going to create a uh, controller here. And controllers have their own base class to extend that's provided by the framework. So we apply class uh, demo controller extends SWP MVC base controller. Right, and then I just want to add one method for now. Call it public function index. Because it's a hello world example, you should accept some arguments. So I'll accept the first and last name. I'll put them both to an empty string. And uh, it's not an And then I'm just going to echo that. Uh, first. Uh, this is the stereotypical hello world. Um, so now I'm going to save this file. I've already put me in the right folder. So we've got the, the file structure, like I said, that's given to you when you use the starter plugin. I've got a directory for controllers, use models. We usually end up creating one for assets as well, which is CSS, images, JavaScript. Um, I'm going to call this, I'm going to put it first of all in the controllers folder. I'm going to name it 
after the class for consistency and the controller.php. Right, so we have a controller, we have a method that we can use. Now I just have to hook it up to a route. And this is basically how I say, when someone goes to this URL, load up that controller class and call that method. Um, we have an added routes method here. The actual wiring is just, there's a filter that the framework uses called SAP and C routes. We hang the add routes method on it. Uh, if you don't want to worry about that stuff, then you can just remember the add routes method and start your plugin is where you add routes. Um, so I'm accepting this array of routes and I'm going to append one to it. And a route takes the form of an array with three properties. The three properties that you need are controller, which is going to refer to the class that we just created. So I'll call it demo controller. Then you need a method to call, which is going to correspond to the function we just wrote, which is going to be index. And then the last thing you need is a route, which is the URL. It's basically when someone goes to the, the URL that we defined here, it's going to trip off that method. Uh, the route in this case, we'll call it uh, hello. And we want arguments, so the token for an argument is uh, colon p. Right. This is heavily inspired by uh, Express, Sinatra, if anyone's ever worked with that. Uh, the only big difference here between what we're doing with this router and what uh, most other MVC routers will do for you, most MVC routers give you named parameters. So I could say colon uh, first name, and then the first name argument would come in based on that name. Uh, I don't do that here because it adds overhead with WordPress. WordPress, you basically have to declare every, every argument as one except for the custom route. And uh, I would rather just use one and be able to pass it right. So what happens when you use more than one argument, which is what I'm trying to do right now, uh, because we want to, this route will only accept the first thing, right? Because there's only one parameter at the end of the uh, What I want to do is create another copy of it that accepts a first and last name. So that way you can hit this URL with a first name or a first and last name, and it will know what to do in both cases. All right, so all I'm going to do with this second copy then is add another column group. And what I was saying about main routes versus this routing uh, mechanism, this is a little dumber. Basically, uh, whatever order your parameters show up in the URL from left to right, that's the order that they'll get passed into the controller. Right, so if I have column B, column B, column B, from left to right, that'll be first, second, third parameter when it pops in. And this actually, well, we're missing still one thing, which is to require the controller. And that's a great thing to put in required dependencies in the plugin class. So I'm going to require once during the file uh, controllers demo controller. And if we did everything right, and I don't have any typos, I should be able to load up hello from every set of numbers. And there we go. Where is the hook for this getting? So it's doing this, and if none of this works, it falls back on whatever treatment uh, WordPress would normally do. It, well, actually, it's, there's there's a little risk there. You have to test all your routes because if if something goes wrong in the routing system, um, what happens is if, it can't, if if the route is correctly matched, but there's not a class or a method to process it, you usually end up seeing the home page. What if, the, if one of your routes that you define doesn't match? If one of your routes doesn't match, then it's either a 404 or it's whatever that you are looking for. Yeah, this, uh, the router basically hooks into the WP rewrite rules. Um, so if you've ever worked with that stuff manually, which is pretty gnarly, this, this basically there's the nice server interface to deal with it. Uh, so, you know, just to show, all right, we're getting, we're getting our arguments, you know, I can put whatever I want in this fragment of the URL, and I will come through as an argument to that method. Um, taking it a step further, might as well make this post loop dynamic. Um, so the first thing that I got to do here is I need to grab the uh, template file. This HTML template that I found uh, is just gorgeous. Um, I'm going to copy first the index HTML file and drop it in the views folder of the plugin. I'm going to change the extension to .tpl. As I mentioned, uh, that's a requirement of the framework to recognize it as a view. And 
and uh, then I know I have to change the reference to CSS. Uh, you normally wouldn't do this in production, but we kept having constraints. So here where we're including the CSS, I just got to add the rest of the URL test that we can count on everyone's demo. And I'm going to put the CSS images in assets folder, as I, as I mentioned earlier. That's just a standard practice for us. Uh, we don't include it in the base plugin because we don't always need it. But as soon as we start adding CSS, JavaScript, or images, uh, that's right where they go. So we create this assets folder. I'm going to drop the images and CSS in there. And I also know I need to change a couple paths in the CSS. So we don't have too many breaking images, although we'll still have some. But again, this is you know more about seeing how it works than uh, seeing something beautiful. Otherwise, I would pick a different template. Yeah. I'll save this. Right. So now, what I can do at this point. I'm going to want to change the route because hello doesn't really make sense anymore. Um, and I don't need arguments anymore either. So let's just get rid of this one. And let's change this one to index without any arguments. I'm going to go back to the controller method. And don't need to accept arguments anymore because there's none coming. And instead of echoing this out, well, I also need this before method. Remember I mentioned earlier, you have to set the template directory so the controller knows where to look. So I'll, I'll use the before method because I know that will run before it invokes the index method. Uh, I'll save this underscore template equals third file. Got up one level and then into the use folder, always including a trailing slash. And now what I can do is I can echo this template index. If we reload, actually we need to go to the new route because we changed the URL. We changed the URL to index. So I go to index now. Now it looks like my CSS is wrong. Did I did I put it I pointed it to one folder? Did I make the folder wrong or I put the wrong you put the wrong in the index file. Thank you. So let's open that back up. Uh, yep, and it's in the plural. Close that out. Reload and should have some CSS now, too. Okay, so now we've got basically a static HTML file at this URL. Still not really that special, but it's not going to take as much more code to make this play anymore. Um, the first thing I mentioned earlier, uh, being able to copy parts of the view. Right? We're not going to want to, uh, we're not going to want to take the whole entire template and repeat it for every post. We well, want a certain region. So the first thing I do is open up the view, and I need to identify the section that's going to represent a post. We only need one. Right? I only need this one area, and we'll copy it and use it for every single post. Area. So I'm going to find that. Um, about here, documentary on thesis. So right here, uh, I'm going to start a region. We'll call it post area. And then wherever it's finished, uh, here, we can close that region. And for good practice, I will just embed this stuff. And then what we want to do is just delete all the hard-coded ones because we're not going to use them. So I'm going to pull all this stuff out. Let's reload it. You should see the same thing with only one post. Our header's messed up. Uh, there's just one post now. So the next step is to start adding in replaceable regions. Right. And if I go back here to the post area, this part, this is going to become the post title. Uh, this will become the post author name. 
this particular one is not a property of the post model. It's actually a property of the post author object. So we're going to need to manually replace that part. The rest should be picked up by the post render method. I'm skipping the date because I hate looking up the syntax for page previews. Uh, post content will go here. And then last we'll do comment count. Just add a little bit to the controller. Okay, so the view's updated, it's ready to go. Back in the controller now, the first thing I want to do is get some posts. So I'm going to use the post all method. Post equals post. I'm asking the post model to give me all posts where the following conditions are true. First, I pass in conditions. I'm going to say, you've seen this already, uh, I want post type equals question mark and post status equals question mark. I'm going to fill in those question marks from left to right. So post type, I want to be equal to uh, post. And post status, I want to be equal to publish. Then uh, we're going to ask for, I'm going to see too soon. Then I want to ask for a limit, so I only want 10 posts. And then uh, I want to order them, posting, descending. This syntax, again, this is uh, PHP Active Record frame, uh, library syntax, which is very well covered in the documentation. Um, the last thing I want to do is I want to eager load a little bit, which we talked about before, so I'm going to tell it include. There's a user relationship defined on the post model, which refers to a user object for the post author. Right? And that'll allow me to load up the user objects to the other so I can get the author name instead of an author ID. And I think I need one more. No, something wrong Where am I missing it? Uh, the function. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Let's close that there. Limit 10 order. Sometimes I think it's syntax highlighted when it's harder to see what you're I closed the array too soon, is what happened. Yep. Okay. So now we're good. So now we've got an array of post objects. If all went well. And what I'm going to do is create an empty string, post listing. And we'll use this to build up the output for the post uh, area. What I want to do is for each posts as post, post listing, we'll append to it dot equals uh, post. I'm going to use the render method to populate any matching properties. This template index. And remember I said obviously you don't want the entire index template for every post. So what I'll do here is just copy the post area region. So this is saying when you render it out, don't take the whole template. Just take the post area region. So we'll only get a post block in there. And then the last thing I'm going to do because like I said the post author name is not actually a property and won't be picked up by render. I'm going to manually replace post author name. And because I uh, eager loaded a user up here uh, I'm going to have a post property called user, which is actually a user object. So I can grab user nice. Right. And now I've got a post listing all built up. So all I need to do is, right here at the bottom, replace post area with our whole post listing. And what we should have, when I reload this page now, is some dynamic content. Right? Post title, author name, post content, comment count. Comment count's working because we can see so there's three comments on that one. Uh, quick demo is, you know, nothing stellar, but 10, 15 minutes to get a dynamic post loop, uh, you know, 10 lines of code. We're eager loading, so don't matter how many posts that we actually retrieve, you know, we're not creating too much overhead. Um, the last thing I want to just throw out there are
what I imagine to be uh, some of the, the most likely stumbling blocks that could come up if you decided to take this one. Um, for some, I know it would have been for me uh, when I was first working with WordPress, object-oriented PHP is going to be a big one. Um, I worked with WordPress for probably a year or two before I ever even knew what object-oriented programming was. I think the reason that happens a lot is because WordPress doesn't really require it and it doesn't really encourage it much. Uh, so you can get by working with WordPress and never write a class. Um, the thing is, most MVC frameworks, including SMP MVC, require at least a cursory knowledge of object-oriented programming. You just basically need to know what a class is, how to create one, how to extend the class. Um, if it's something that's new to you, uh, some of the resources that have been invaluable to me, PHP Object Oriented Solutions, uh, that's a book where the first few chapters is all I've read, and that was enough to get me started just building classes, extending them to the point where I could start learning by doing. Um, as far as links go, I'll post these slides up afterwards and read them, so if anybody wants the stuff, it'll be there. Um, PHP in Action, that was uh, another one I read at the, at the very beginning of my object oriented career, and uh, it was very good for me as a conceptual overview. Um, kind of just gave me the overall understanding of what I was getting myself into. Uh, something that I do quite frequently now is uh, going on Wikipedia, uh, looking up design patterns, which basically a design pattern is an object oriented solution to a problem that repeatedly occurs in software development. So uh, abstract level stuff like I need this variable to only be able to happen once in the code, right? Not necessarily talking about global, but I need an object that you can't make more than one copy of. Those sorts of abstract level problems that do repeatedly occur, uh, they, they're codified and standardized and referred to as design patterns. So what I'll do is I'll go to Wikipedia, I'll look up a list of design patterns, I'll grab a random name that looks interesting to me, throw PHP in front of it and plug it into Google, and read through someone else's implementation. And that's just a good exercise for me to see if I can wrap my head around something that I haven't done yet uh, and see if I can work that into my own code. Um, keys to success for me uh, in growing as an object-oriented programmer have been, first of all, to start small and be persistent. Uh, it's a bottomless subject, and you can never stop growing with it. Uh, the biggest thing that helped me to kind of like move forward with it was no matter how small it was, whatever I was capable of working into, whatever I was coding at the time. So if it meant writing a class with one method and calling that method, I'm going to do that because I need to get used to doing this. And just building on that until it finally gets to a point where everything I write is fine. Uh, then two little one-liners that I keep in mind that uh, are useful, the last of which is useful whether you're object-oriented or not. Uh, typically try to aim for small classes. So really, generally, we'll aim for like less than 10 methods inside of a class. Uh, all of the methods in the class ideally are handling something related to the other methods in the class, so there's an overall sense of cohesion within it. Um, and then aiming for small methods, and this is one that I mentioned can work whether you're doing objects or not, whether it's a function or a class method. Uh, typically, I like to try and keep them under 10 lines. Um, they should always only be doing one thing, and definitely if you have to scroll to read the contents of an entire function, for me, that's hard to do. Uh, the next thing that you could run into, compatibility issues between WordPress and the framework. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, SWP MVC models are based on PHP Active Record. PHP Active Record is not recognized by WordPress. So if I can get a post object from the framework and I try and pass it to a WordPress function, WordPress won't know what to do with it and it probably won't come back. The trick to this is just to be willing to opt out. If it's more convenient to just use the WordPress API, you just use the WordPress API. Um, the typical approach that we use is if it's shorter to write code one way, we take that way. The only time that we'll cancel that out is if the shorter way creates a performance step like introducing an N plus one query. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that a controller method takes over a template redirect action before any output is generated. So like I mentioned earlier, in a controller method you have the same amount of responsibility as you would when you're writing a page template. Um, the things to keep in mind because of this are the typical actions and filters that run in a normal WordPress request. Uh, the codex has a pretty exhaustive list. It's good to know and it's good to be familiar with. Uh, it's okay, we're almost through. Um, and I can do the rest of it. So, um, B 
being aware of the, the typical sequence. And for the most part, what I found in writing these controller methods is if you call a get header and you call a get footer, optionally get sidebar if you need it, you're probably going to have most of the actions and filters fire just from that one. Um, if you notice a funny behavior, something's not happening that should be, or something's happening a little different than you expect, then the next course of action is looking at custom code, looking at plugins, looking at themed code that depends on some more obscure hooks or filters. And if you find that to be the case, then it's just a matter of calling do action or apply filters within your controller method to make sure that that's not happening. Um, the last thing that I want to just go over real quickly, idiosyncrasies of the framework itself. Uh, obviously, there's kind of a lot happening with the framework. I'm hoping that we got into it enough that like, people have gotten a sense of it tonight. Uh, but because there's a lot going on, uh, there's a lot of documentation. And it's out there for you. It's shared between the various libraries that are used. So, for example, like PHP Active Record is doing the models. PHP Active Record has its own set of documentation. If you're dealing with querying, saving, validating models, then you would consult the PHP Active Record documentation. If you're looking at rendering models, that's in the framework documentation. Um, the uh, documentation, I hope, is very thorough. I have gone to lengths. I know it inside and out, so maybe I miss stuff. And again, that's why, you know, open an issue on GitHub uh, on the repository or tweet at me. I'll be happy to help anybody out. Um, there's a tutorial included in the documentation if anybody's like me and hates reading documentation. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, Stamp Template Engine, which uh, handles the views. The author of that template engine decided to create a new version which breaks the API of the old one. I personally hate his new version. Uh, I think it defeats the whole beauty of his original. So we opted to stick with the old one, but we've documented it in the framework documentation. So that's there for you. Um, last is underscore PHP. And again, if anybody's used underscore JS before, it's just a PHP port of that. Uh, I find it to be incredibly useful. Totally optional, but it's available to you whenever you're building on the framework and great to have. Um, that's everything I have. Uh, guess that was kind of long. I'm really grateful that you guys all hung in there with me. And I hope that you found it valuable. I hope that some of you are in intrigued enough to actually try to handle this. And I hope that as a result, you get as much out of it as we have. Um, if anybody does dig into the framework, run into any questions or issues, uh, open an issue on the GitHub repository, tweet at me. Uh, I'm really, really geared towards getting some adoption for this, so I'm going to be aggressive about supporting it. If anybody wants it, it's there. And then lastly, of course, the, the ideal situation is people contributing. So if you have ideas for the framework and you want to dig into the source, open up a pull request. I would be ecstatic to see it, and I'll be happy to pull. Again, thank you all for your time. Um, it's been great.